Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at some of the most compelling strategy games we have to look forward to in 2023. Between RTS, turn-based, 4X, and anything else that fits under the larger strategy gaming umbrella, including, yes, tactical RPGs, there are quite a few titles that are set to release in some form or another spread throughout the year. I'll be talking about sim, management, and city builder games in a separate video releasing soon, so if you're interested in that, make sure you keep an eye out. As always, any games you hear about in this list are games I intend to cover on the channel through previews, reviews, deep dives, and more, so if you'd like to stay up to date with them and you're not already a subscriber, make sure you subscribe. If there are any games that you're interested in, either in this list or those that I've missed, let me know in the comments down below as I'd love to know what you're looking forward to and I'm always happy to add more to my radar. Now, without any more time to waste and with timestamps down below, let's take a look at my most anticipated strategy games releasing in 2023. Company of Heroes 3 is set to release in February 2023 after having been delayed from its November 2022 release date, and it's looking like an absolute blast of a game that'll explore some great new mechanics and theaters appropriate for its World War II setting. We'll be seeing an evolution of the familiar real-time tactical battle mechanics that involve capturing strategic points, seeking cover, holding up in buildings, and acquiring resources with which to train more troops and bring forth more devastating tools of war, all in a new, beautiful part of the world. The Mediterranean will see you fighting among the mountains, across coastal regions, and in vast deserts alike, where line of sight remains as essential as ever, with verticality now playing a greater role than before. There are also new systems involved with moving troops around on top of vehicles, towing and repairing destroyed vehicles, and clearing out buildings, and the Steam page claims intelligence will be more important than speed on this new front, which implies tactics trump APM, which is something I'd love to put to the test. But things go beyond the real-time battles this time around, with the addition of the dynamic campaign map that brings a more sandbox approach in the Italian campaign, alongside the typical linear approach that we'll still see set in North Africa. I'm particularly curious about how this dynamic campaign map gameplay will work, giving the player more control over which units are brought to different engagements and where those engagements happen in the first place, alongside control over the movement and actions of naval and air assets alike, and the option to use special unit abilities to support your troops or hinder the enemy in and out of the real-time battles themselves. You'll use ships along the coast to bombard enemy positions before engaging them in battle, you'll drop in paratroopers to get behind enemy lines, you'll sabotage enemy supply lines, so on and so forth, and with the broader objectives and timelines spread over multiple days if not weeks, it gives the player much more agency, and I'm always a fan of these added strategic layers. It's nice to see Company of Heroes not rest on its laurels, experimenting with massive changes to a familiar formula after having pretty much defined an entire subgenre. I cannot wait for this game to come out, and February isn't too far away now. Total Conflict Resistance is set to release in Q1 of 2023, and it's looking like a very interesting game blending 4X, RTS and first-person shooter mechanics in a very compelling way, giving real Mount and Blade vibes in an era of modern warfare. It is a time of civil war, with your island nation having been split up into multiple factions, and you will have to manage not just the military aspects of your faction, but diplomatic, economic, industrial, and legislative aspects too, with several nations to interact with, religious sensitivities to balance, and a broad spectrum of politics. At a strategic map level, your overall objective is to conquer the whole island and unite it under your flag. You'll be able to navigate a tech tree spread across a few different categories, each unlocking new tools for your troops to use on the battlefield, spanning everything from more advanced tanks and MLRS to attachments for weapons like sights, new types of magazines, etc. etc. The latter of which become a lot more directly relevant when you're involved in the FPS side of things especially. Not only will you spend time researching these new weapons of war though, you'll actually need to manufacture your equipment at your cities as well, taking time and resources to produce one at a time, forcing you to choose which soldiers get the extra help on the battlefield depending on what they're up against. These troops will each carry their own individualized equipment, and they'll group up into squads that further join up to form battalions that you can order around on the strategic map. You'll need to concern yourself with losses in a battalion, while also worrying about the actual supplies your battalions are carrying as they travel from place to place, as inevitably, one of the places they'll be traveling to in the middle of a conflict is likely to be a battlefield, which is when things get really interesting if you choose to fight the battles yourself rather than auto-resolve. 
When said battles kick off, you get transported to the battlefield to take control of things in first person. You will play as an individual, able to change what unit you're directly controlling, moving around, shooting, and ducking under cover just as in any FPS. But you'll also be giving commands to your troops in first person, telling your soldiers where to go and who to engage, just like in Mountain Blade. If you're not a fan of the FPS style of gameplay though, you'll be able to quickly shift things to a more RTS style of camera angle and control scheme instead, giving orders to your troops while seeing the battle unfold with systems like the occupation of buildings during urban combat, stances used as troops move around under fire, full-fledged environmental destruction, lines of sight, cover, etc, etc. And naturally, the strategic map decision making determines the environment you're fighting in and what you're fighting with and against. The scale of this game is extremely impressive and I cannot wait to check out the full release later this year. Homeworld 3 is set to release within the first half of 2023 and as a huge fan of the Homeworld series from when I was a kid, I cannot wait to see where things go here. The Homeworld series has always had a compelling narrative, beautiful music, and really fun ship designs and space battles to go with them. And looking at what the devs have shared so far, we can expect more of the same from Homeworld 3 with a single player story mode, a co-op mode that has a roguelike structure, and of course, PvP multiplayer. It looks like the devs aren't just resting on their laurels either. There's some serious innovation going on with how ships will use cover and hide among derelict space hulks that you come across, using them like one might use terrain in an RTS that's not based in space. And evidently, ballistics will be fully simulated, making minor celestial bodies and debris floating off the aforementioned space hulks that much more important alongside line of sight and angles of approach. You'll navigate space storms and asteroid fields, you'll rush behind debris to take cover from missile salvos, you'll tuck into tunnels to hide from enemy radar, you'll build ships of various classes, you'll set up ambushes and trench runs, and you'll do all of this in a fully 3D battle space where danger and reinforcements can come from any direction. Naturally, all the usual tropes of RTS gameplay can be expected too. Collect resources, recruit units, manage population, go from objective to objective, etc, etc. But I'm really curious to see more about the narrative itself and this co-op roguelike approach too. I really want to know how that plays, how that feels, and what exactly they mean by roguelike there. With what little we've seen so far though, Homeworld 3 is already looking very good and I cannot wait to get my hands on it later this year. Baldur's Gate 3 is finally set to release in August of 2023 after spending quite a bit of time in early access. Developed by the folks behind the Divinity Original Sin games, you can expect Baldur's Gate 3 to be an impressive CRPG chock full of lateral thinking, implementing the 5th edition rule set of Dungeons & Dragons as faithfully as possible when making an adaptation into the digital space, of course. I've played the early parts of what's available in early access a few times now, and the game has pretty much everything you could want from the genre in-depth character creation, a great cast of non-player characters and party members alike, a variety of fan-favorite races to pick from, and a huge selection of classes to choose from as well, many of which were added over the course of early access. These each come with their own strengths and weaknesses, as well as unique class-specific dialogue options and skill checks, and I expect they'll each come with unique opportunities based on circumstances as well, as is the Larian Studios' way. Honestly, the pedigree alone is enough to get me excited for this game, but the return to Baldur's Gate and all the wild adventures it holds is exciting as well. Turn-based tactical combat pairs with real-time isometric exploration, all of which allows you to take advantage of your character builds in clever and unique ways that'll be familiar to those of you who have played Divinity. Clever ways to problem solve are one of my favorite aspects of playing tabletop RPGs, and seeing the devs try to keep that spirit alive in the CRPG space is great as always, and with the early access builds showing great potential already for those who are willing to look around for unique, more characterful solutions to typical adventuring party problems, I'm very much looking forward to what else is happening beyond the early access spaces. This game is looking like an absolute audio-visual treat, with an interesting narrative to tie it all together, and I cannot wait to dive into it when it releases later this year. The Great War Western Front is set to release sometime in 2023, allowing us to take control of either side of World War I in an attempt to win the Western Front. 
either by diminishing the other side's will to fight or by conquering Paris or the German headquarters, depending on which side you choose to play as. At a strategic level, you'll be managing the movement of troops across a grid-based map, making sure the right troop types end up in the right section of the front for the task ahead of them, and you'll push for various strategic locations that might provide you with a benefit or with the hopes of denying the enemy access to it instead. And of course, you'll slowly fight the Great War inch by inch. But that's not all. You'll be managing the construction of various buildings and the research of technology across a few major military fields, and beyond that, you'll tackle all manner of events that'll influence your game, at times offering side objectives to further bolster your chances of success as you manage your national treasury and distribution of supplies across the front. While the national treasury is used to acquire or maintain troops and build buildings, supplies are needed for the actual battles you'll be fighting when troops clash on the campaign map. You'll have the option to auto-resolve these battles or control them directly, where the game does an excellent job of representing trench warfare, having you build your trench network at the start of each battle, placing trenches of various sizes and the connections between them, alongside artillery positions, barbed wire, and more. What's cooler, when a battle takes place on a hex where you'd previously fought a battle already, you'll actually see old trenches as part of the battlefield, available for use as things swing back and forth, over and over again, really evolving the battle and campaign maps simultaneously in a pretty impressive, persistent way. Shifting weather conditions will have a role to play as well, and you'll have to consider elements like visibility, accuracy, and movement speeds as you balance the safety of hiding in the trenches against the inevitable, dangerous need to charge forth and rush the enemy to get a hold of victory points while under fire from enemy artillery, aircraft, rifles, and machine guns alike, Unless, of course, you're able to coordinate your own attacks while suppressing them with the help of your own artillery and air support and so on and so forth. From flamethrowers to tanks, there's a wide variety of technology on display in this era of change, but one thing holds firm. The desperate need for supplies as a resource on the battlefield, used up every time you order an artillery salvo, every time you bring in reinforcements, and every time you ask for your air force to provide support. Completing side objectives mid-battle might supplement the supply you start with, but this added layer of economic management during battle just adds an extra bit of strategy in such a brilliant and meaningful way. The Great War Western Front looks like it's going to be a real time sink, and I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on it later this year. Spellforce Conquest of EO is coming soon on Steam, though the publisher's website says the game will be releasing sometime in 2023, bringing the fantastical world of Spellforce a 4x strategy game. You play as the heir to your master's wizard's tower, and choosing from one of three archetypes to play as, you'll have access to a variety of spells, abilities, and tools, each of which allow for different playstyles as you explore the grid-based campaign map turn by turn, and as you recruit heroes to join your cause and lead armies into turn-based tactical battles, similar to the Age of Wonders series, where action points, ability use, and unit variety really shine. Your wizard's tower itself can be upgraded over time, giving you access to additional rooms from which to perform research or recruit additional units, but beyond your central tower, Territorial gains are made by sending your armies out and about to either conquer points of interest and resource harvesting villages, or befriend them. You'll similarly gain access to additional troop types as you travel, from goblins to griffins and everything in between, including 100 different types of units, and you'll supplement their capabilities with your own magic, with over 60 spells available across the three aforementioned archetypes. Will you be a necromancer taking advantage of the undead? An alchemist mixing potions and producing explosive vials for use in combat? An artificer crafting glyphs and artifacts to strengthen your troops and heroes? There's some impressive looking depth here, with some particularly interesting ideas when it comes to crafting your own equipment and soldiers, in the case of the necromancer especially. And I'm a huge fan of the huge variety of troop types you get to lead in the turn-based tactical battles. I've had a chance to check out an early build of the game, and so far, things are looking pretty good, and I can't wait to see the final build in action later this year. Broken Arrow is currently slated for a 2023 release date, and I'm extremely excited for this absolutely massive Modern Warfare real-time strategy game. If you're familiar with the war game series of games, Broken Arrow will feature a lot of similar elements, allowing you to take control of units across land, air, and sea as you fight massive battles across 
absolutely huge battlefields, pitting a massive number of American and Russian forces against each other, featuring over a hundred different units to choose from for either side. There's an element of deck building involved, inviting a layer of consideration as you have to concern yourself with what your enemy might be bringing to the field, while also allowing you to determine your own playstyle and strategic approach before diving into a battle. Here we'll see a level of customization to the units that I don't think I've ever seen before, allowing you to upgrade ground vehicles with better armor, defensive systems, weaponry, and sensors, while allowing you to modify your aircraft in what weapons they carry, what kinds of countermeasures they use, etc, etc, and further allowing certain special forces to be customized with access to things like suppressors, thermal optics, drones, and more. It's a really interesting element to add in here, especially since Broken Arrow seems to be the kind of game where every tiny consideration makes a huge difference, from differing armor thicknesses at different angles, to different ammo types for use against different targets, to adjusting the altitude of choppers to hide from anti-air, there'll be a huge slew of considerations across recon units, infantry, armored units, artillery, anti-tank teams, anti-air units, tactical missiles, airdrops, and logistics alike, forcing you to take into consideration opportunities across combined arms, and asking you to consider elements like your supply chain for when troops start running out of ammunition, need medical supplies, or repairs mid-battle. I'm a big fan of this scale of strategic consideration, and it looks like the devs behind Broken Arrow are taking all the right things into consideration with the game. I cannot wait to check it out. Espiocracy is listed as coming soon, and I wouldn't be surprised if it makes it out sometime later this year, given how much we've seen across the multitude of dev diaries that have been released so far. If you're familiar with the channel, you'll know I'm very interested in the Cold War era and espionage as a whole, and so a grand strategy game starting in set time period focused around espionage is obviously right up my alley. Espiocracy will allow you to play as one of 74 countries, taking charge of their intelligence agency through thick and thin, dealing with everything from staffing to securing operatives, all the way to nuclear brinkmanship, the space race, decolonization, and more. You'll use agents to manipulate people across national borders, establishing, bolstering, or weakening political factions, pursuing proxy wars, and potentially causing trouble in ways that ultimately forward the goals of your own nation, whatever they may be. Target people in positions of power or clout, twisting the arms of celebrities, politicians, and inventors alike, or sway foreign political parties, guerrilla forces, and trade unions. Find ways to influence foreign media and internal agencies, and use up to 34 different types of operations to spread ideologies, to perform assassinations, and to infiltrate your enemies with agents who largely operate on their own volition, trying to complete tasks you assign them using their own approach as determined by their traits, expertise, biases, and loyalty. You'll see spies turn coat, you'll see wars break out and change the stakes, and you'll see spies within a single agency form subgroups and cliques, potentially influencing your greater organization as a result. The dev diaries have been so informative with regards to the behind-the-scenes workings of all the many simulations that run during a game of espiocracy, and it's quite evident to me that this game is going to be one of the deepest GSGs we've seen. It's looking absolutely fantastic, and the attention to detail as well as the expansive global approach is great to see. I might actually do a separate deep dive video into Espiocracy. If y'all are interested in that, let me know in the comments down below because there is a lot to talk about and I could literally spend 30 to 40 minutes just describing all the various mechanics and systems that they've already showed in their dev diaries for Espiocracy. Either way, I cannot wait to check this game out. Mars Tactics is set to release sometime in 2023, putting the player in charge of either side of a conflict on Mars. Will you support the capitalist Melon Corporation, or will you side with the workers of Mars, the labor, and help them seize the means of production? The two sides are asymmetrically designed, and they'll engage across the surface of Mars on the strategic layer, where you'll not just need to manage your faction's economic and military capabilities, but where you'll also need to be mindful of your actions and what they mean to both the bigger and smaller picture. Armies kept near each other on the campaign map will appear as reinforcements mid-battle, the destruction of resource production sites will lead to the fluctuations of said resources' prices, and as you fight across multiple fronts, soldiers will suffer injuries and fatigue, needing to rotate with fresh recruits, each of whom develop traits and personalities over time. You'll take advantage of artillery strikes and air strikes to soften the enemy up before an assault, you'll have access to vehicles to overwhelm them on the battlefield, and you'll find yourself challenged by the goal-oriented AI 
that thinks a few steps ahead when planning its own moves at all levels. And when battles actually happen, Mars Tactics is taking a pretty open-ended approach that'll allow players to flex their lateral thinking muscles. Your soldiers, for example, will be able to fire in any direction with bullets that are actual physical entities that follow the laws of physics, opening up creative opportunities like blowing a hole in the roof to throw a grenade where you otherwise previously couldn't. I'm liking the level of detail and the open-endedness on display for both battle and strategic levels, and I cannot wait to put it all to the test. Broken Roads is set to release sometime in 2023 after being delayed out of a 2022 release date, and it brings with it a narrative CRPG with isometric exploration and turn-based tactical combat set in post-apocalyptic Australia. What draws me most to this game is its aesthetic, and even more so, its lean into meaningful philosophical choices and how scenarios in Broken Roads are all designed so they can be approached however the player wishes, either through extensive dialogue trees and conversation, or through violent turn-based tactical combat, with either being a viable option given circumstances and how you've built up your character and party of five. The game avoids a class-based system, instead allowing you to build your character however you want, an approach that I much prefer, and you can also kit your entire party out however you need at any given moment. Your moral compass will constantly spin as you're presented with quandary after quandary, and each decision you make will have an impact on your relationship with your party members, as well as future choices you can make and how things might play out. Though, ultimately, there are no right answers per se. The moral compass is not a binary black and white, but instead a four-way spread that's influenced by what kinds of conversation options and actions you take as a utilitarian, a humanist, a Machiavellian, or a nihilist, giving access to traits and modifiers according to how your philosophical leanings evolve over time, presumably inviting a fair bit of replayability and exploration through multiple playthroughs. The story itself develops in a non-linear way, which is always great to see, and from the sound of things, decisions you make will often show consequences much further down the line, meaning each playthrough can be quite unique, developing very differently from one another, and once more adding to the replayability factor. Broken Roads is honestly checking all the right boxes based on what we've seen so far, and I cannot wait to check it out later this year. Miasma Chronicles is set to release in 2023, and I'm really excited to get my hands on this upcoming title from the folks behind Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden, an excellent game that released a handful of years ago now. If you played that game, a lot of the systems here will seem familiar, with real-time exploration having you lead a party of adventurers in a post-apocalyptic world, transitioning to turn-based tactical combat when you get caught sneaking around, or when you decide to pull the trigger on your enemies after having moved your party members into optimal positions for the task at hand. This blend of real-time exploration and turn-based tactical combat was really well executed in Mutant Year Zero, and looks like more of the same here, alongside stunning visuals, a deep narrative, and a mysterious antagonist in the form of a savage force known only as the Miasma. A force that you actually have some control over thanks to a mysterious glove you'd been given by the very mother who had abandoned you as a baby. You and your robotic older brother slash guardian character must traverse the post-apocalyptic wasteland to learn about the Miasma and perhaps your own self, meeting all manner of eclectic characters will join you on your journey as you take on side quests to supplement your primary task, engage with dangerous enemies, and spend time getting to know your counterparts, gaining XP and upgrading their unique character-specific abilities to take on the Miasma as a team. I had a ton of fun with the last game these devs put out, so I'm really excited to get my hands on their next project. It looks absolutely gorgeous, seems to have a great sense of personality, and like its predecessor, seems not to get mired in procedurally generated missions and maps, instead creating an entirely handcrafted experience that I cannot wait to dive into. Falling Frontier is currently set for release sometime in 2023, with the scope of the game having got much bigger, and it remains one of my most anticipated games of the year for 2023. Falling Frontier is aiming for a deep, compelling narrative told with a very cinematic approach both in and out of gameplay, with small, decisive battles where every hit counts and where every loss is felt, where a more hard sci-fi approach is taken across all aspects, and where managing your supply chain has actual importance. Operating at a system-wide scale, 
players will have to deal with physicalized resources that need to be shipped from facility to facility in order to actually use, asking you to establish forward operating bases and to consider where you store construction materials, fuel, and munitions, and where your warships need to go in order to rearm themselves after a battle, or where reinforcing ships can be manufactured for a rapid response when necessary. Small details like this add up to give Falling Frontier a grand scale where every decision has weight. You'll concern yourself with system-wide radar shadows and disruptive nebulas. You'll adjust your own recon stations to balance between accuracy and range, and you'll try to intelligently place your warships, never knowing if the enemy is hiding near one of your shipping lanes to cut it off before a massive assault. Depending on your needs and current situation, you'll be able to customize your ships to configure their combat and non-combat capabilities. You'll train troops to actually operate these ships, gleaning benefits from their experience and skills, and you'll often send rescue parties to rescue those floating in space after having ejected from a doomed ship. You'll seek prisoners to interrogate, you'll research advanced technologies, and above all, you'll try to balance each call you make as you work through one of the key design elements of the game choice and consequence, where everything you do has weight and importance and no decision can be made lightly. Falling Frontier is looking absolutely gorgeous, and if you're curious about more details, you might want to check out the video I've linked in the pinned comment down below for my deep dive into the game based on my chat with the developer. I cannot wait to play Falling Frontier and explore its many complexities later this year. Manor Lords is currently slated as coming soon, though with how the demo at the end of last year went, I wouldn't be surprised to see a 2023 release date. A historical city builder slash strategy game, Manor Lords puts you in charge of a plot of land and asks you to build a town up from nothing, from agriculture to its military capabilities too. All aspects of the game are immensely detailed, and that's the key appeal to Manor Lords alongside its sheer audio-visual beauty. Houses aren't just residential zones, for example, they're historically appropriate burgage plots where part of the land is used for living and part is used for production of goods for the family and the community. Eggs, goat milk, vegetables, etc. Farms are still needed for larger scale food production, of course, and even then you're looking at soil quality, fertility and season, as well as concern of crop rotation or the need to leave the land fallow in order to restore fertility. Hunters seek out animals that'll migrate away from civilization, needing to physically kill their quarry and bring back their carcass to process into meat and hides. Said hides can be processed by tailors or cobblers, while the meat can be bought by the townsfolk at the market or traded with wandering merchants for money instead. You'll collect taxes, you'll build up your manor, churches, and military, and you'll look to keep the people happy by meeting their needs through the research of advanced technologies, through trade, or through local production. At times, you'll come across other local lords and engage with them in diplomacy, and at times, this diplomacy will go sideways, resulting in open conflict. And even here, Manor Lords goes above and beyond. Your soldiers will be equipped with whatever you're able to manufacture at your town, and they'll be actual townsfolk too, meaning any losses on the battlefield will directly impact your population at home. So, as you take command of your soldiers, you'll want to be careful as you use formations, special abilities, the high ground, and flanking tactics alike to overcome the enemy and return home victorious to till the fields and shear the sheep once more, while you perhaps gain more plots of land to expand into to further enrich the lives of your people and yourself. Manor Lord's interconnected systems are really impressive, making it a perfect blend between city builder and strategy game, at least in my humble opinion, and the dedication to historicity is very nice to see, as are the innovative mechanics, even in familiar spaces, which are always a welcome sight. I cannot wait to show Manor Lords off on the channel. Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader is coming soon, but seeing the great state of its current alpha build, I would not be surprised to see it released sometime later in 2023. Based in the grim dark sci-fi universe of Warhammer 40k, Built off an existing tabletop RPG system, adapted by the extremely talented team at Owlcat Games, Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader is shaping up to be an absolutely fantastic CRPG in which you play as a rogue trader, a member of high society in the Imperium of Man that is allowed to bend and break rules that most would be burned at the stake for, leading not just your party of intrepid adventurers, but an entire trade empire as well. The rule set being adapted allows for a fairly broad variety of class options and a huge variety of abilities and skills for your heroes to use, as well as fancy, 
over-the-top weapons in both melee and from range, alongside some wild magical abilities that tap into the ever-dangerous, demon-infested warp of the Warhammer 40k universe. My time with the Alpha so far has been extremely promising, with some really cool enemy types on display already, and the game blends isometric exploration, turn-based tactical combat, and a deep narrative excellently, while also dabbling in fresh ideas that include taking your spaceship from system to system, fighting turn-based space battles, and developing colonies on planets while also building your trade empire, managing relations with other trade factions, and seeking potential opportunities for expansion. The game does an excellent job of building atmosphere too, and it has some very interesting quest-giving mechanics as well, between the traditional main and side quests and the whole rumor system, where you come across hearsay that may or may not be true, but begs investigating for potential boons, or perhaps dead ends. It makes the universe feel that much more alive and opens a more interesting slew of options as far as engaging where and how you want to. Even the open world is used as an opportunity to either flesh these rumors out or let the player skip right past them, leading to much more replayability and room for discovery. I could talk at lengths about why I'm excited for the final build of this game to release. And if you're curious, I recommend checking out my alpha let's play that I'll link in the description and pinned comment down below. Needless to say, I'm really excited for this one. Stargate Timekeepers is currently listed as coming soon, and we've seen some gameplay of this real-time stealth tactics game already, looking like a pretty fun ride over the course of 14, 40 or so minute long narrative-driven missions, set at the end of Season 7 of Stargate SG-1, establishing its own storyline, parting ways with the actual TV show. If you're familiar with games like the recent Desperados 3, you'll recognize some of the concepts on display here, where each of your handful of characters have unique abilities that you'll use in real time to help get around all kinds of dangerous situations as you explore the narrative beats and accomplish objectives one level at a time, crouching and sneaking around, keeping an eye on enemy sightlines to avoid detection, using cover and distractions to create openings where there otherwise weren't any, knocking out and tying up or otherwise killing your enemies, so on and so forth. Your enemies, meanwhile, each have their own strengths and weaknesses, needing alternate approaches based on their type, where some might be more resistant to old tricks, asking you to devise new tactics to overcome them. There will be a fairly large cast of player characters based on what the devs have said so far, with some characters being locked in place for certain missions, but other characters being variable choices, meaning there should be a decent bit of replayability on that front depending on which characters you bring for any given mission. The devs have said there will be multiple solutions to any single level depending on, again, which characters you bring, but also which abilities you decide to use, how and when, and all this will be happening across expansive maps and missions, which will themselves have multiple, literal angles of approach too. I love that kind of open-endedness in a game like this, and I'm a fan of the genre to begin with, so I'm really excited to see exactly how Stargate Timekeepers plays when it eventually releases, hopefully later this year. The Stone of Madness is coming soon, and it's looking like a very interesting stealth tactics and puzzle game in which you lead five characters to help them escape their 18th century monastery, which acts as both a prison and a madhouse. The usual tropes of the genre apply, with each character having unique abilities that must be used in tandem to see success, but there are some really cool innovations here as well. For one, the game map is procedurally generated with each playthrough, leading to a fresh experience each run. Beyond that, a day-night cycle invites different kinds of activities as you manage time as a resource, with different options available at different times of day. What's more, character progression takes on a unique flavor as each of your party members might not just gain positive skills, but also afflictions of the mind like paranoia and dementia that negatively impact your playthrough. There's a bit of a roguelike element here too, perhaps, as you can learn secrets about the monastery and then use that knowledge to gain an upper hand in future runs, even with the aforementioned procedural map. There is a lot going on here that I've never seen before, and it all sounds very compelling. I'm keeping an eye on this one for sure. Terminator Dark Fate Defiance has had a bit of a rocky road, but it's still in development and might be releasing later this year. Or so I hope. While the original Skynet timeline is my favorite Terminator timeline, and the only one that really counts in my humble opinion, I'll never complain about an RTS set in the universe, and this one is looking pretty good based on what we've seen so far. 
Apart from PvP and skirmish mode, there's also a narrative campaign that has you leading the human faction known as the Founders in an effort against the Machines of Legion. A third faction, the Resistance, is featured as well, and I'm curious what differentiates them from the Founders human faction. I imagine it's an opportunity to have an additional faction for added unit variety, and a second human faction could make for some interesting twists and turns, as the Steam page implies, in the post-Judgment Day world, the greatest threats may not come from the machines, but rather from other human survivors. Whatever the case may be, it sounds like the single-player campaign will have a bit of a persistent element, having you carry your surviving units from the end of one mission to the start of the next, which is a great way to make each loss have value, and it sounds like there are fairly complex subsystems at play that we don't often see in what otherwise looks like a classic RTS. Vehicles, for example, are made up of components that can be individually damaged where armor is tracked separately, malfunctions can occur, and the loss of a unit is about more than just an emptying HP bar. This, alongside the physics-based environmental destruction that results in real-time battlefield developments, sounds like really neat systems whose presence tell me this game isn't just trying to rest on the success of its IP. There's some work being put in here to make a game with interesting mechanics and systems worth checking out. I've definitely got an eye on this one. King's Orders is currently seeing a TBA release date, and it might not even release this year, so I won't spend too much time on it, but it's such a creative idea that I wanted to bring your attention to it ASAP. The game is set in medieval Europe, with the option of playing during one of many conflicts ranging from the Hundred Years' War to the War of the Roses to the fall of Constantinople and more. Regardless of when you play or who you play as, it's the way you play which is most intriguing here, as the game is all about sending your orders to your generals spread across the land, telling them where to go, what to do, and how quickly to go about doing it, using messengers who must travel back and forth to and from their current location to where you're seated. The game explores an aspect of warfare that is often ignored in these games, how orders actually get to their recipient, and how reports get back to the monarch so they can make further decisions. The results of a battle aren't just telepathically shared with you. You have to wait for the commanding general to send a runner to let you know what happened, and only then can you decide on what to do with the necessary information. Meanwhile, messengers can be intercepted and killed, preventing vital orders and reports from getting through on time. And loyalty plays a major factor, not just with your messengers, but your underlings as well. Something you'll be able to read into based on the missives they send back to you, with their word choice and tone playing a key role. Not too much is known about King's Orders, but what we've seen so far is extremely promising. This is looking like a very unique title with some very clever ideas, and I'll definitely be keeping up with its development. There you have it folks, my most anticipated strategy games of 2023, with another video focused on city builders, sim, and management type games coming soon. If you're interested in keeping up with the games and genres you've seen mentioned here today, you might want to consider subscribing, and if you have any games you're excited for but didn't see mentioned here, feel free to drop them in the comments down below and I'll check them out. If you learned about a new game here that you didn't otherwise know about before, feel free to hit that like button down below too. And as always, of course, a massive thanks goes out to all of my channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.